I've gotten submissions from folks that have uh, significant followings. And like I've seen it, I've seen them say it just flat out. Listen, if my film is in there, 200 people are going to show up, you know, and if you're the film festival, you take that stuff into account because you want to be able to show that you can fill a room. Hey, actor, welcome to Lydia Nicole's Acting Smarter Now podcast, where I help actors level up their game. Have you ever wondered what it's like to network effectively at a film festival? or how to maximize being at a film festival as an actor. Well, today you are in for a treat because I am speaking to Mr. Troy Pryor. He is an actor, producer, and the founder of XL Film Festival. And he is breaking it down step-by-step step what you need to know when you enter a film festival or when you attend a film festival. So without further ado, let's go to the interview. So tell me, what is a film festival? A film festival is an amazing event, an opportunity to bring together storytellers, typically to showcase the film projects that they produce, worked on, performed in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, typically, you're also going to have some type of events, some parties, some mixers, some mingles, opportunities to really network and connect with folks and uh, it's just a really great moment to celebrate the craft of storytelling and bringing uh, artists together. And why should filmmakers put their projects in film festivals? What's the importance of that? Well, you, you know, oftentimes a film festival is one of the first opportunities to get your work in front of an audience. And so you want to get some feedback. You can see what works, what may not work. Uh, especially if you are a, a rising creator, you may oftentimes do a short film with the aspirations of doing something larger. And your short is what gets you in the festival. Uh, it's also a great opportunity to build some great relationships with folks. And if you are, if you're operating at certain levels, the film festival may also be a um, be a market for you, meaning that you may go to the festival to sell your project. That's a whole other level of festival, but that's another huge uh, part of the deal flow if you're operating at that level. And what's the benefit of actors participating in films, short films and projects uh, that, that are going to go to film festival? What, what do they get out of it? Again, a great opportunity to meet other performers, other uh, filmmakers, uh, you know, it's a relationship business. Uh, what I've really learned from being an actor that's on stage as well is oftentimes you have a keen ability to rock a mic or moderate a panel and being in front of an audience, it gives you another platform for people to learn more about you and, um, and what you're capable of. So you may have a project in the festival or you may be a moderator on stage in some capacity. So those are all great opportunities. You had mentioned that it's, it's a place where you also network. So how can actors come to the festivals and network in an effective way, not just hanging out, going to the parties, but how can they be effective at the film festival? We, you know, I oftentimes talk about what, what is real networking. It's not just passing out business cards, connecting with folks. Uh, you know, for me, I would research who's going to be at certain events or who's speaking what did they work on? What are they talking about? Are there any synergies there? Uh, do we have any type of connection? And I know that when I'm going to set event, uh, that I am a brand, I'm thinking of it as a business opportunity. And I want to meet with this person, this person, this person for this reason. And this is what I have to offer first before I ask. And it's not just, uh, here's my business card. Check this out. Can I follow up with you? It's no, I realize that uh, it's great to meet you. Uh, I noticed that you know, these are some of the things that are aligned with your current goals. And I think I can add value to that. So I would say anybody that's going to network in any capacity, that it has to be an active thing versus uh, just meeting someone, taking a photo and getting, a, you know, shaking a hand. You, you made a point of saying, how can I be, um, what can I offer? I think that's a really important thing because a lot of times actors don't know how to speak up. They don't know how, you know, they get nervous, they get excited. 
uh, they get intimidated, but they don't know how to come in and be of service. So with that in mind, how, how do you recommend actors volunteer to help at festivals? Because a lot of festivals uh, need volunteers. That's how they survive, you know, because they don't make a lot of money. Um, so if you could talk on that. Sure. So one way that actors can really get involved uh, with festivals is through volunteering. And it could be as simple as, hi, my name is Troy. Um, I, I love your work and the festival that you have coming up. Are there any opportunities to volunteer? Uh, I can bring my camera. I can document. I can take photos. I can be a red carpet correspondent. I can check people in at the table. I can pass out lanyards. Because at the end of the day, it's oftentimes just about getting in the room, right? Because you, if you got all the other stuff, like we're taking for granted that you've done your homework and you're, and you're ready to be in the room. Now it's about access. So it's just, how do I get the access? Because once I'm in the room, I'm not worried about anything else. So uh, if that means that I'm just checking people in at the table, that's what that means, you know? And, or you can keep it even simpler than that and say, listen, I, I can fit in, you know, I can get in where I fit in. What do you need? That can be a, a more direct opportunity because uh, most festival programmers, organizers uh, will have a, a list of uh, responsibilities that need to be filled out. And then you can just go from there. How early should an actor reach out to the festival to find out what the deal is? How can they get uh, um, caught up in helping them? So there's no one way to do it, no one singular blueprint, but I would say if you're at the festival right now, you should be talking to somebody right now, <laughs> talking to them right now, because in most cases, even when you have all of your, uh, your I's dotted and T's crossed, there's chaos, there's organized chaos, and there are opportunities at times to jump right in the mix, because there may be something you can do right there on the spot. You don't have to force it, you know, because you got to give people their space, but who knows, there may be a table that needs to be moved, a chair, and you can just help right then and there. But that's when you really, that's when you really learn people is when you're working with them. So I would say you should be talking to them right there in the moment with the caveat that you'll probably need to do some type of follow-up because it can be difficult to have the level of conversation you want to have with somebody right there on the spot. You know, typically you want to give the folks that are organizing some time to uh, decompress and then follow up. But at minimum, I think you should be planting the seed right there at the beginning, exchanging information and then, you know, asking them, when can I follow up? Again, I can always assume I'm going to follow up and, you know, as soon as possible and then give it some time. But you can also ask, you know, when would be a great, would be a good time to follow up. Another thing I would say is really important is, um, oftentimes the individual you think you should be talking to, it may not be that person. It may be somebody else on the team that will actually help you move a lot further. So this is where your research comes into place. I need to know who's on the team, who's the individual I should really be talking to right now. And maybe that's the way to at least start developing the relationship. But the win it, to me is always right now. And then you judge that by the flow of things like, you know, and sometimes they'll tell you like, give me a month before I can really uh, check back in and you respect that. Let's talk about the don't, what actors should not do because you made a comment that they should have already done their homework. A lot of times actors don't do their homework. They just are excited. So let's go through things actors should not do either volunteering or wanting to volunteer or when they go to a film festival? What are uh, faux pas that they really need to stay away from? I would say, and it probably covers several things, but I would say we mentioned not being prepared, but forgetting that the individuals that you're talking to are human beings. I think that's the probably the biggest faux pas is you're forgetting that this is a human being. Um, you know, they breathe, they eat, they sleep, everything like you. And so oftentimes 
Um, we can be so excited that we forget to connect with just interpersonal communication. We forget that. And, uh, and that could throw off the whole conversation uh, versus uh, just introducing yourself, understanding uh, timing is key. Oftentimes, whoever you want to talk to, a lot of people want to talk to. And when that person is done speaking on stage, whether if they're on panel or if they're just present, they may have a line, they may have people crowding around them, and you're just trying to figure out how to get in that crowd. And so I think it's also important to pay attention. You know, like if, if you've noticed that that individual just talked to 20 people, it unfortunately, it may be harder to engage with them in that moment and it's nothing personal. They, they just may be tired, you know? And so I think it's important to um, know what tools to pull out when you need to pull them out. So I think the biggest thing is uh, not being observant of the moment because, you know, there may be a moment where you don't have to say much to them. You know, you might see them in passing and maybe that seed opens the door to a future conversation. Uh, one of the things that I knew worked for me, not saying that it worked for a lot, that it for everybody, but I would, A, if, if the setting was some type of panel discussion, I would try my best to get uh, in the front row as much as possible so that there's some type of eye contact, right? 93% of communication is not auditory. So I'm, I'm trying to, I want to make sure my presence is there. Then I would pay attention to what's being said, do my research and try my best if there was a Q&A opportunity with the audience to at least raise my hand or try to try to become one of the five folks that may get an opportunity. And I keep it simple, you know, keep it a simple question because I know the conversation that I really want to have is after this moment. So all I'm trying to do right now is ride the wave, make sure that a connection is felt or made. And then hopefully later on, I can have a more thorough conversation versus trying to do everything at the same time in that 90 second, two, two minute window. And it may be information overload and burn out. And now that opportunity is missed because it was counterproductive. So I think that that's one of the biggest things is just not being observant of the moment. So I'm looking on Instagram. I see Excel Festival is getting ready to come up. How would I do my homework for the festival? What should I look for? What should I be, what kind of questions should I be asking myself when I'm doing the research? If you're an actor uh, and that if the question is, you know, pertaining to an actor, I would certainly research to see if there were any producers or directors of projects that I previously worked on or had some type of connection with or maybe auditioned for. I would look to see uh, who those, uh, who the moderators are, anyone that is in some type of uh, position to help move the festival along or whether there was an institution or organization. I know that there are plenty of performers that have brands. And so there are meaning like there's a product that they sell and that's also a great opportunity because festivals are always looking for sponsors or looking for vendors. They're looking for all these other ways. And again, like you said from the beginning, if you've, if you've taken care of everything else, it's really about access. So maybe you are a filmmaker, and I'm just using this as an example because I just got off the call with the vendor that has an ice cream company. And uh, we have an outdoor event. So this individual reached out and said, hey, I've got a new flavor coming out. And uh, this summer, and I'd like to pass out samples. Next thing you know, they're a vendor for the festival. And then they told me they have a short film and now their short film is screening. You know, like they're just different opportunities. And I think that when you do the research, you can find out what tools do I have that I can pull out. Maybe I'm not presenting myself initially as an actor. Maybe that's just a part of it that comes with it. Uh, and you know, maybe what, what voids do you have that I can feel or what um, value can I add uh, to help? And that opens the door for these other opportunities. And going back to the research, um, I, I just want to add something. There is a AI called perplexity.ai. 
And if you put somebody's name in it next to their title, their position, it will give you a bunch of information on them. So if you see that uh, Troy Pryor is doing a festival, type in Troy Pryor. So you can see what Troy Pryor has done. That is, is one of the greatest tools you can use. It pulls from all different places. So you also get footnotes of where they got the information. I got this from IMDB. I got this from blah, 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 blah. And it, it gives you articles on the person. It also gives you videos on the person. So you can get everything. I know that when the actors went on strike, part of the thing was about AI. So there's some cons with the AI, but then there's some pros. And we need, as actors, we need to know what the pros are. And one of the great tools uh, for researching is AI. You've been in the business a long time. I've been in the business 50 years. And I can tell you that research was always part of how I was taught. But for me, in the old days to research, you had to go to the DGA, buy their book. You had to go to get their uh, their book to see who the directors were. And it only came out once a year. So if they had a bunch of new projects, you didn't know about it. Um, they, you know, you had to get the um, newspapers and um, the trade papers and there was no computer that you could go and say, let me look this up. Everything you had to do by hand, you had to call people and say, hey, do you know Troy Pryor? Who is he? Tell me a little bit about him because I'm going to go meet with him and I need to know. As actors, it is really important for us to do our research. The ability to research everybody from commercials to short films to documentaries, whatever you're doing type in the name of the person, find out what they've done. And also in, in IMDb, you can see who they've worked with so that maybe you, you, you've never worked with Troy, you've never worked with uh, so-and-so, but they worked with this other person that you worked with a few years ago, and now you have a connection. Now you can talk. So when you're networking, you have something to say. Um, when you said when people are finishing the panels and they're coming and they're being bombarded, in addition to understanding that they're people, understand that when you're on stage, whether you are in a speaking capacity, whether it's emceeing, hosting, um, uh, being asked questions, when you come off stage, you are not focused. So you can, they can talk to you, but they're not present. They're still kind of uh, getting that that stuff off of them from being on stage. They're still on that high. So it's it's in your best interest to get their information, uh, write down whatever you learned from them at that um, panel, whatever you got from them, write it down and then send them a DM or a, a email or whatever and say, hey, I met you at Excel Festival. I really loved when you were talking about how actors need to research and be prepared. I never thought about that, but you have given me such a wonderful piece of information. I'm an actor. I'm a new actor. I've, or I've been, uh, you know, pounding the pavement for the last couple of years. And I love what you do. I love what you stand for. And I would love to be part of your, your uh, entourage, your ensemble. So, you know, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I, and I appreciate you and I'll continue to follow you and that's it. And then you let it go, let it go, let them come back to you. And if they don't, then maybe a couple months later, you know, uh, start following them on social media and see what they're talking about and join the conversation. Don't, don't be obnoxious, but, but offer be of service. Because sometimes, you know, as actors, we are so excited. We want so much for people to know us, but we we forget in that excitement that, that there are people, they might be tired, they might be hungry. You know, they're good people, but you've caught them when they're, when they're already on overload. Um, I wanna ask you, if someone has a project 
what should they start doing to get that film out there to different festivals? So there are a couple of platforms that you can use, one of which is very popular, Film Freeway, which is a database of tons of film festivals. And they have various uh, levels of membership that you can create in Film Freeway, but it gives you plenty of opportunities. And within that one platform, you can identify the festivals that are most aligned with the genre of project. Maybe your festival can fit in a variety of fests. Maybe it's a very niche uh, project and it, it only applies to certain, but that will cut out a lot of your time, a lot of the research time, just to figure out what is the best opportunity uh, for your project to be, uh, to be seen. Uh, I would say that's probably number one, just because it gives you access to so many uh, resources at one time. And then you have your bigger festivals that have been around, your, like your markets, your Sundance, Tribeca's, uh, things of that nature. You can go straight to those sites, uh, figure out what they're looking for. Sometimes a way to get into the festivals are their labs. So sometimes these festivals have uh, year-round programs. Uh, and so there may be an opportunity to get involved in one of the educational projects and you get to build relationship with folks and it doesn't guarantee anything, but it certainly helps to have a relationship if you have a project um, that you can, you can showcase. Uh, there are at major festivals, you typically have a lot of brands and organizations that have uh, experiential events and pop-up events. So those are other opportunities to meet the people that curate and program. Sometimes they have, uh, you know, you can meet the programmers directly. And in most cases, all those individuals are listed somewhere. But I would say uh, if you go into the big players, all their information is on their website. If you're looking at the thousands of other festivals, use Film Freeway. It's a great tool. How valuable is it to start small and move your way up? Because everybody wants to go to Sundance. Everybody wants to go to Sundance. But Sundance may not be the first place for you to go. You might want to work on your craft, work on your skill sets. And then when you really feel ready, then go to Sundance. But uh, we, you know, as as actors, as filmmakers, we we dream, you know, it's like, I want my stuff to go to Sundance, but we're not Sundance ready. So what is the value of starting small? So it's a part of the process. You know, to me, a lot of this is very reminiscent of playing sports, being an athlete, you know, the human body can only take so much. If I'm not bench pressing 450 pounds, I'm not putting that on the bar right now. You know, I need to start with something I can control because I can get hurt if I don't do that. So this idea of making sure, one of my mentors used to tell me, master your market, right? Uh, even, even the conversation of moving from one side of the, the, the country to, to another coast or whatever that may mean, it's like master where you are right now because you can oftentimes use it as an incubator moment. You can um, try things, test things out, see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, not only with your craft as a as an actor, as a filmmaker, but also your ability to navigate rooms. You know, people are people. And so it's a great opportunity to figure out um, how to prepare when I am in, in those other rooms. What can I do? And, no, and most um, cities have some type of, uh, of, of community festival or maybe it's a showcase. Maybe it's not even a festival. Maybe it's uh, just a community event or a showcase opportunity. Maybe it's an opportunity to show something at your church. Maybe it's an opportunity to show something to your family, you know, but it at least starts to prepare you of what to do when you get in those rooms. Uh, and then, you know, festivals cost money. So, you know, you want to do your research to figure out that even if you have the opportunity to go, um, does it make financial, you know, does it make financial sense? as well. So take all that stuff into account. And so starting small gives you the room to figure out some of those, uh, some of those questions. How many uh, films do you get? Because I would think it's very competitive. So how many do you get average? And how many do you actually accept? So for Excel, that is because Excel has Excel Fest, excuse me, because Excel Film Fest has evolved into Excel Fest, more of a cultural experience. 
we have a much more curated moment for act for actual films. Like in the first year we did it, we only screened 10 projects. The next year we looked at the time and we had uh, 24 hours of content that was spliced up amongst several theaters. And now we actually curate for a variety of festivals. So uh, we get hundreds of submissions across our uh, festival network for XL. Uh, I would say we're, we would probably within 24 hours and a lot of shorts, a couple of features, you're probably looking at 35, within that 35 to 40 range, depending on the time of the content of projects. Okay, you just said you're curating for a lot of festivals. Okay, so let me ask you, um, when they are submitting for the festival, the criteria that the festival puts out, how important is it to follow the criteria? It's extremely important. Um, so there are a couple of perspectives. I would err on the side of caution, especially if you are just starting out and you may not have leverage or relationship or access because like anything else where, where an individual entity is vetting, whatever it may be, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed with things. And so oftentimes if you haven't uh, fulfilled the requirements, you're eliminating yourself from the beginning before they even watch the project. So I know that if we have short film blocks and we're saying that your projects can't be longer than 10 or 15 minutes and you send something that is 20 minutes off top, it's getting discarded right away from that space. And it it would be lucky if we got the opportunity to go back and look at submissions that may have not made the original cut. I would not bank on that happening. So I would definitely stick to the uh, the mandates, the requirements that those film festivals are, are saying. If there's certain uh, types of content, um, subject matters, you know, every festival is gonna have its own theme. They're looking for something specific. Um, I would stick to that. Uh, and, and this is where relationships matter a lot of like i tell you right now i got hit up by a lot of folks after the deadline like man i got this short i want to get it in i'm like man you're making my life so much harder <laughs> you know we've got a team of folks that are already curating so i have to be very honest with them um i personally recuse myself from selecting any of the films because that would continue to happen and so i have to tell them like our team is already curating so the biggest thing outside of the mandates is getting it in on time um, because otherwise, uh, you know, it's, the, the chances of it getting it at all are completely diminished if we don't have it within the time frame we're supposed to have it. So deadlines are important. Okay, so let's talk about deadlines. Is it better to get it in early? If you want uh, a less stressful experience, I would say get it in uh, as soon as possible. Because you don't, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where something gets lost in the submission portal or somebody's Wi-Fi goes down and you had all intentions, you know, even even waiting to the very end where you're submitting it and you're within the window. Technology does what technology wants to do sometimes and there's less wiggle room. So I would say get it in as soon as you can if it is ready. This is not me saying to rush, because if your project's not done, then make sure it's done. Like if you gotta clean up some audio, if there's something you need to polish up, then do that for sure. But if your project is done, then get it out of the way and submit that. Okay, let's talk about faux pas of projects. Do not send projects that are... Uh, I would say, you know, against whatever that film festival was looking for. So for me, you know, Excel is all about empowering. It's about um, accelerating uh, rising storytellers. So, you know, we're not doing projects that are like three hours long. That's just a timeline, you know, type thing. We're not doing projects that have an unnecessary amount of negative uh, content 
stereotypes, things of that nature. Like, you know, we, we don't want to limit the artist craft. And if there is something that is necessary to tell a story is one thing, but we're certainly not in perpetuating uh, negative stereotypes either. So um, we, we stray away from, you know, things of that nature. So we want to make sure when we send the, the film that we are within the, the timeline, not way too close to the deadline, but we want to make sure we are prepared that the film is ready. That means it has, it has gotten its post, the sound is great, the colorization is in, everything the film needs is already done. Yes. If it is not, do not send it in. That's right. It, 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 film festivals are very specific about what they're looking for. You don't want to send a film about a little uh, Appalachian girl to a Black film festival. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I, I'm glad you brought that point up because there are, so, there are some festivals we curate for that there's a real question around what is a black film does it mean that it's the story or is it the creator is it is this person that's um that's of a different ethnicity do are they but they tell a story uh, let's just say if it's a you know they're telling a black story can their content still make it into the project because of the story or is does that come off as performative because it wasn't told? So there are real conversations, you know, about that. And sometimes it is case by case. Um, but we something else to consider is sometimes we can be very specific as filmmakers of said uh, background or ethnicity. Those are some things that we'll also look at. One other thing I forgot to say, uh, and this is not for Excel, but some festivals will require it to be the premiere. So that's something else to consider is if you have a project that's been um, circulating already, maybe it was online. Uh, I mean, I have my perspectives on that. It's not something that I really, you know, I don't, we don't have, you don't have to premiere with us, but I would say before you spend money or research, see if they require you to premiere the project because it may, it may be a liability for you because you're waiting to show it there when you could have had it in front of a ton of audiences already. That brings me to the marketing. I'm a filmmaker. I've gotten my film at your festival. What do I, as the filmmaker, need to do in order to push the film? Because there's a lot of other films. You're not promoting my film. You're, you know, you're promoting the festival. So what do I need to do as the filmmaker for that uh, uh, festival. Sure, I would get you know I would start with the simple things like make sure they send you your laurels, the little tag because that's that's a nice little stamp that draws attention to your project. Update your cover art for your project. You know even if it's a lot of times people don't even read all the film festivals that you made. It's just the the quick visual they see that okay there's your I saw your um, cover art but now. Uh, a month later, your cover art has four laurels on that. So it's communicating that people are buying into this project. And sometimes all you need is momentum. That momentum can move you forward. So I would say update your press material, whether it's your deck, whether it's your website. I would say create a website for your project. Something that's very simple. People can go to, click it, maybe see a trailer, look at the information about the cast. Oftentimes, if uh, an audience doesn't know a whole lot about a project, but they but they know something about the person that produced it or the people in it. It may draw some more attention to the project. So I would take advantage of all that. If you do have anybody that's on your project, well, you should do this in general. But especially if you have somebody in your project that has some type of presence on social media, I would ask if they could reshare. Uh, information as well to promote because that person may have a greater reach than you have and it can draw more traction uh, to them. Um, you know, I could even 
if you want to get super, super specific, you know, yeah, I'm looking at who I cast from the beginning in the project to figure out, like, if they can do the job, that's one thing. But if they also have some commercial viability, then I know that my marketing on the back end of it uh, will be a bit more manageable. It may be easy to sell. I never make any guarantees. But if you got somebody in there that's hot, you know, meaning like they're popular, then it's going to attract some more impressions and eyeballs, which could mean some more sponsor dollars. As a person that's on both sides, I always look. At, I also look at the experiential aspect of the festival, and I know as a filmmaker, I have been able to leverage content and the story that the content tells, and then create some type of event around it at set festivals, which have allowed me to attract way more resources and relationships because now my project is not just screening in a block at a theater where maybe the cinema holds 100, 150 people, 200 max, 200 people. And now the project that I worked on that's that has something to do with mental health, I'm able to now go to... Um, a healthcare brand and say, listen, we're going to screen our project at this festival, but we'd like to have a conversation afterwards about wellness. And then we want to give out um, some type of pass to a local health club or a gym or something. And so now the, now it's a whole different conversation now. And now that project has become a tent pole. So, you know, this is just me at this point, but, you know, if you're a filmmaker, I would think of, all of the different ways you can leverage the fact that your project exists and not just that it's the project, it's that it's the stories it tells. Uh, I would also look at, um, again, if, if, if there are charitable organizations that are aligned with the uh, message behind your story, because they may say, hey, we saw this project at this festival, but we have this, this, and this going on around the country we like to add it to this, you know, to that event. And or we know that you're responsible for creating it. So even if we don't have an opportunity to place your project, we'd like to pull you on a panel at said festival or expo. And now all of a sudden, because you made this 10 minute short film, you've got a world of opportunities that uh, you would not have had if you only submitted your festival to be screened in a block in front of 150 people. If you're a filmmaker and you come to the table with an organization and or a brand that either has some sponsorship dollars and or helps you elevate the profile of the festival, then I think that is included in your packaging or your conversation with the festival. Here's my film, but there's an opportunity for said organization to now sponsor Q&A afterwards or sponsor a reception. I think you bring that to the table to increase your value because you know that that film festival will, will probably at least want to explore that opportunity. So when I'm submitting the film, I would bring that to you when, uh, before I even get in. I would do that because I would come to the table like loaded with as many opportunities as possible. So, you know, the, the only caveat to that is you know, we have to acknowledge that if said film festival becomes over commercialized, then it could lose the it has the potential to lose the integrity of the artistry because now it's just it's really just a matter of pay to play at that point. Uh, but if you're the filmmaker, just like casting certain people in your project, uh, working on certain equipment. Like all of this stuff adds value to what you bring to the table. And even as a, if you're a filmmaker, we talked about it earlier, if you're an actor, a filmmaker that also has the ability to uh, be a great host or a moderator, like these are all things that I would include. As here's, here's what I can bring to the table, to this festival. Here's my film. And here are all the ancillary opportunities that we can also explore. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking more of, community outlets so so that um bringing nonprofits that are connected to whatever my topic is 
So if I'm talking about teen pregnancy or if I'm talking about high school dropouts, um, that I would connect the Board of Education or I would connect Planned Parenthood. I would bring in um, someone that is not commercial to bring more uh, of community um, awareness, to give you ammunition to help the film and also help the people who are seeing it, right? Absolutely. And I know I've gotten submissions from folks that have uh, significant followings. And like I've seen it, I've seen them say it just flat out. Listen, if my film is in there, 200 people are going to show up, you know, and if you're the film festival, you take that stuff into account because you want to be able to show that you can fill a room. And so those are just some things, you know, to consider. We talked a little bit about the marketing. Now let's talk about the promotion. So I've got my film in your festival. How, how would I promote it in addition to marketing it? So Am I going on social media and uh, telling people, hey, I'm in XL Film Festival. I need y'all to come out. You know, where are my people at? I need you. Uh, I'm doing a live. I'm, I'm, you know, giving a little bit about the story that I just did and the cast. And maybe on my live, I have one of the actors and we're talking about, you know, the, the, um, the project and what it was like to film it. Um, is is all of that beneficial for me as a filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, you were uh, you were actually coming up with a lot of ideas that I would say. Uh, right let me tell you, I'm, yeah. I'm a master at what can, yeah. what can we get done with a little bit of money because mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and th this is more for people of color. It is that we don't know how to play the game. We think we're in a film festival, that's enough. And that's just the beginning, or not even the beginning, but that, 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 that's like, okay, you got in a film festival, now what are you going to do? How are you going to get right. your stuff out? How are you going to let the media know? You know, you, you're hitting people on social media, you're hitting websites, letting them know, hey, my project is going to be an XL Film Festival in Chicago. I am so excited. This is my first film. I have, um, I have Blair Underwood in it. I've got Vivica Fox. I've got this person I'm, I, and this person, and they've all done it as, as for love. They all did it for love. And yeah. so um, I, I'm going to tell everybody I'm going to tell my grandmother, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm going to be sending them emails out every day. I'm going to be hitting people on, on my text. I'm going to be reaching out and saying, hey, we need all of you to come out. This is when it counts, not after the fact, but we need you now. We need you to go buy your ticket right now. Here's the website link. Go get that ticket. And then when you, after you see the movie, write a letter to the people at the film festival and tell them how much you love this movie more than anything in the world. We need you to support this film like you've never supported anything before. You know, it, and, and we don't do that. We, we tend not to do that as people of color. There's a stigma attached of it being bragging. I, I heard somebody say this the other day. I want to slap them across the head. But um, I, it, it, it is, it's not bragging, it's promotion. It is all about, right. you know, putting it out there. No one will know if you do not tell them. And we, we tend to be victims of not wanting to sell our stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's 100% true. And I'm listening to you speak and I'm like, uh, do you want to, can you join our festival <laughs> team please? <laughs> No, I but think it's right, important. You know? And and that's why that's why it was important for me to interview you because we don't have the information. I want this, mm -hmm. I want this to go out as the information. So if you're thinking of 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 signing up for a festival, here's what you need to be doing before you even, you know, start getting buzz on your film so that you can get into festivals. Start you know, getting a Susie who has a podcast, Mary who has a podcast to talk about, you know, hey, what was it like to write this script and how did you get the cast? And, 
you know, how did you, uh, you know, the, the sets are amazing. What did you do? You know, it's like share everything you did in the process to get people to start talking about it. Those little, those little tidbits are really important. You know, it, it, it matters as an independent filmmaker. No one is going to bring it to you. And as a, as a filmmaker of color, no one is going to bring it to you. You have to go and get it. That's, that's all yes. I want to say. You got to go <laughs> get that puppy. Ain't nobody, you know, it's like, it, it, it's actors do this all the time. We get booked on shows and we are waiting for a miracle for somebody to say, hey, let's nominate you for an Emmy. It don't work like that, people. It's a campaign. So you got to start the campaign early. You know, if you want if, if you want to get attention, you got to start tooting your horn. You got to get people out there talking about your your performance, whether it's a one person show, whether it's a, a student film, whatever it is, start telling people what you're doing. You know, don't don't do it in the dark in the corner. <laughs> you got to do it in the light of day and start telling people so they can champion you. So you can start getting those fans. Hey, this is what we're doing. We, we need you to show up for us. You know, it, it's like uh, when I first started acting, um, I would send out postcards to everybody to say, I'm in, I'm going to be in this show. It's coming out on this day. And if, and if it was something that I couldn't get a postcard out in time, I would call. I would get on that that old rotary phone and just start calling people. Hey, I gotta be on the Jeffersons. I gotta do this. You know, take. I, I would. Uh, the first thing for me was to take out an ad in the trades. That was always the first thing I needed to do because I needed work. And if the industry didn't know about me and my friends in my neighborhood knew about me, that wasn't gonna help me. But letting the trades know, you know. When you when you book when you when your show gets uh, uh, you, when your film gets in a festival, you know, put that out there. Put out those little messages. Send it out so that the industry is getting to know about you. They're getting information about you. You know, put out a little uh, uh, thing with you on set saying, "Guess what? The work has paid off. We're gonna be on XL Film Festival in August, and we're doing this, and we're you know, it's like we're." We are so blessed that this project is taking off. If you want more information, let us know, you know, and, and, and just start bombarding people, letting them know. It's like every year when the Emmys come up or the Oscars come up, the same story we get. They're not, uh, there are no black people in the, that are being celebrated. There's no Latin people that are being celebrated at all. Well, that's not the time to be talking about it. You should be in the, you should be involved before the film comes mm -hmm. out and saying, hey, we need these people in this film. We need you to start putting people of color in this film. And then when the film comes out, go to the box office and pay your money so that they know, oh, this is great. And then start tooting the horns of those actors saying, oh my God, this was a great actor. This, this actor, and let the studios know that this actor did a great job because they are setting up their campaigns for the Oscar. They're not, you know, I don't know why people think that with awards, it is just, it, it's, it's miraculous. It, and that's the only way I know how to do it. People actually have events where they are promoting their films to the people who um, make the voting decisions. They are courting those voters from SAG-AFTRA, from the DGA, from the Oscars, the, the Academy to say, hey, our film is here, we matter. And I learned that from doing Making the Five Heartbeats because it was just me and Robert. We were the little train that could. And my thing was, oh no, we're, we're going for awards. 
So how do we do this? And I just started calling. So, so what do you need to do in order to, to qualify for the award? Mm -hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. And I was calling the, the guy at the academy every day. Okay, so I did that. So what do I need to do now? I know I made that guy crazy, <laughs> but it put us on the long list. You know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it made a difference. It, you know, it, it affected something. And we were able to get nominated for an image award. We didn't have backup. We didn't have a studio. It was just us. But I kept, I was calling the the Image Award people. Okay, so how many people vote? 300? No. No, you have 300 and only 25 vote. Oh, okay. Well, we're giving everybody a DVD. I will be bringing it to your <laughs> office tomorrow. And we, and, and me and intern stuffed the envelopes. We put the DVD in the envelope. We had a screening. We could not compete with all the the other uh, documentaries that were out there, like um, uh, Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston and um, uh, Quincy Jones and uh, RBG. They they were the other four that we were. I mean, there were a lot, but they were the four that we finally came up with. We were nominated with those four. So for me, that was the win because we beat all those other people that were uh, submitting their stuff. We didn't have a lot. So what did we do? We had a little screening. We gave everybody popcorn and soda. That's all we could afford where all the other people, <laughs> Quincy Jones's people had them come to his house. They had, they had food and they, you know, they they had all this stuff. We didn't have that. We, we you know, it was like we, we can give you popcorn and we could give you soda, and that's what we can give you. And thank you so much. But it starts from somewhere, you know. And I think people are uh, uh, they they don't understand the process. So um, you jump in anytime to share. No, I'm I'm listening. Like yeah, that was that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's so true. It is a process. And I think um, one, of, one of my friends told me this a long time ago, such a simple quote, but made a lot of sense. He was like, you can't make demands until you're in demand. And so it's like this idea of you got to start somewhere. You know, you might not let this, you know, you eat, what is it? You eat an elephant one bite at a time. Like these are all wins. Like celebrate the fact that this is a win. To your point, you've got these other uh, powerhouses in this category and you're selected and you're popcorn soda, but you're in there, you know, so it says something, um, you know, it, it says something when you are being uh, placed, you know, in those in arenas with folks that are on these large pedestals, you know, it, it is definitely a process and that's a win. That's something to, to, um, to a be grateful for, but also uh, celebrate. And to our earlier point about do you go straight to Sundance or do you go to a smaller festival? It's like it's all a win if it's helping push you forward. And it's all about the work. You know, I'm a big believer in in eating that elephant one bite at a time, but I'm also a big believer in being the tortoise and not the hare. Mm -hmm. That slow and steady wins the race. You know, the Bible tells us. Do not despise small beginnings. But as, as actors, as filmmakers, as creatives, we want it now. We want the superstardom now. And that's the lie. You know, you see influencers and they go, I got a million uh, followers. And you don't know what those million people, where those million people came from. You don't know anything about mm -hmm. that but you you get stuck on i gotta get this i gotta get you know it's like no you gotta you gotta build the right foundation you know if you're an actor you gotta take classes if you're a filmmaker you need to learn about the camera you need to learn about angles and storytelling and and casting there's you need to know about set design there's so much you need to know for years I had a lot of interns. I'm a big believer in, in nurturing and growing people because that's what was done for me. And I can tell you that most of the interns that I've had all had grand ideas that 
their short film should be at the at the academy for short films you know they they and and some of them good enough and some of them not good at all and you have to know you have to be honest with yourself you have to go uh you have to watch it like it's somebody else's film and go is this really good if i were looking at this would i go ooh i like it let me share with people or am i just blowing smoke up my own butt because i did it it's like you have to know if your work is good or not and i'm going to cut you off there's a level of humility to your point that you know we have to be self aware but we also have to be able to take a note because we will always have our unconscious bias. We'll have our bias. You know, we think that everything we create as artists is the most magnificent thing in the world. But it's important to have individuals who, yes, you respect and have the credibility to give you some notes and being able to take those notes because if they are truly for you, uh, then they're just they're giving you feedback that will help you to grow. And, you know, sometimes we'll shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot because we don't take that note. We don't learn, have to learn it the hard way. Um, and I think there's, there's something else to, we talked about the research, um, timing is so important in everything, but especially this because you could have a lot of the things, all, a lot of the boxes checked off, but you have to pay attention to the timing as well. Is this the right time? for me to release this story? You know, is this the right time for this? And it may not have anything to do with you, but, uh, you know, if you put it out there too soon or it's the wrong timing, then it may not have the impact uh, that you want. So that goes back to research. You know, if you're a filmmaker, it starts with the story. You gotta really do the rewrites, 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 rewrites. Two, two drafts does not make a complete film. You know, it, did you flush it out? Did you do a table read? What was the feedback you got? How did the actors respond to the pieces? Did they elevate it or, or were they stuck? You know, are you telling a complete story? Because as a filmmaker, you're telling a story. So it starts with the page. You have to tell a, a um a very captivating, engaging story. You can't just go, I'm going to tell this story about the guy because I saw something similar on Amazon Prime. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and do my version of it. There's no real thought and consideration. You're just ripping something someone else did and you're maybe changing the names of the characters and now you are a filmmaker and that's not how it works. And so you have to... Um, you have to really be diligent about your art, get better. I want to get better and better and better. So maybe you do a film that's five minutes. So you're learning how to tell a story in five minutes and then you bring it back and you go, okay, I, I, I think I'm getting the hang of it. So now I'm going to expand the story. I'm going to do a 10 minute short. I'm going to go get another actor and see how that works. I'm going to play with, with um, the, the camera and see what kind of angles I can get. I'm going to see how I can tell this story. How, uh, instead of using all these words, how can I tell the story with a minimal set of words? What, how can I get in there and tell a, a captivating story? Because a film is about seeing it's not about, you know, we don't want um, talking heads. We, we want to see something. We've got to see transformation. So how do you tell the story? It's like then as a filmmaker, you grow and you grow and, and, and look at the best projects, the award-winning projects. Did you think it should have won? Uh, or was it a hyped up thing that just got the votes? Because... Just because a project wins doesn't mean it is award winning. It's worthy of that award. You know, I went yesterday and, and saw a theater piece that uh, came from um, the National Theater in London. And, you know, we as Americans have a high regard 
for British theater and British actors. And that's why they come and take our jobs. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but I was watching this piece. And so I went in anticipating this was going to be a brilliant one man show. And I'm sitting there. And at the end, I'm like, this was a work in progress. But they are confident and and they feel like they produce great work. So this piece is now in theaters across the country. They are backing this piece. And I went, oh, I get it. It's about how you perceive it to be. And are you really committed to it? Because I, I thought I thought it was a great work in progress. Now it it would I look at it and go, oh my God, this should win awards? No, I want to see him do it again. And this time, clean it up, clean it up now. You know, just because you're in London don't mean you you got it all going on, but we have to treat the work as, is it the best work I can, I can give as an actor when we do the work is it the best I could do? Did I make hot choices? Did I come prepared? Did I bring life to this character in a way that you'll never forget that character? You know, that's that's our job as actors, as filmmakers, to tell a story that haunts somebody or to tell a story that every time you think about it, you just laugh and laugh. You go, oh my God, that story. But But we don't sometimes, especially people of color, we are so hungry for product that we take whatever is put in front of us, you know, instead of going, yeah, I have a discerning palate. I'm not eating that because that's not how you make collard greens in, in a cornbread. I'm not eating that. That is not, and don't, you know, that is not fried chicken. That chicken is bland. It has no, no seasoning to it. <laughs> no, no you will thing. not give me that. But, but we just, we just take mediocrity and we go, this is great. It's like, no, it's not. You have to be able yeah. to discern what is great writing. You know, what is, what is great? Just because so-and-so says it's great, you don't have to buy into that. But you do have to buy into doing your best work, your best work. I get people all the time wanting to pitch a script and I go, um, how many rewrites have you done on this script? And then they get quiet. I said, you ain't ready. I said, first of all, we don't take, we don't take unsolicited material, but I'm gonna tell you right now, you need to do some rewrites on it and then have a table read and then get feedback and then go write and then have another table read. We don't know that process. So I, I just, I think it's important to put that out because we, we have been so trained to take the crumbs instead of saying, no, we deserve the meal, a meal that has you, you, you licking your fingers like, oh my God, that was so good. That was so good. And just because a white production company does it, does not elevate it it does not mean it is all that and a bag of chips mm -hmm. so yeah, we have to a, you know so i don't know why i'm saying all this but yeah i just somebody needs to hear that I'm a, yeah uh, they're gonna hear it. they receive that i receive that it's all the line you know understanding our value is huge because it, it diminishes uh you know our abilities to negotiate and, and leverage things it's like if you accept anything that you're, that you're given it also helps elevate others that want to continue to take advantage of you and exploit you because they know you give them anything they're going to buy it they're going to come they're going to line up outside and buy it and it could be the lowest quality product that uh, didn't cost much to put together and uh, you know we'll still go out there and get it which makes me think of taraji p henson um when she was crying because she was saying you know she still couldn't get her worth, that she still was being asked to do uh, projects and not get her pay. That, um, and, I, and I go, whoever her agents or reps are, they should be fired right away. 
because she should never have to come onto a stage and say, I can't get paid my worth because of my color. Her, her representation should be fighting for her. They should be saying, no, she is just as good as a Robin Wright or a uh, Naomi Watts. She needs to get her pay, you know, and if, and if the people who um, represent you don't fight for you, it, it's hard for you to fight for yourself as, a cre as, a, as an actor, as a filmmaker. You need the people that are representing you to say, no, my client is just as good as Tom Cruise. They may not have the name uh, uh, ability right now, but they should be making money. It is imperative for people of color to come out swinging with excellence, that we yeah. have to be excellent. You know, when I was a kid growing up, that was all I heard in my house. You got to be excellent. You can't, you can't get away with what the other kids do. You know, you got to work harder. And, and we've kind of lost that along the way. Um, we're, you know, we're sliding in. Sherry Shepard had a, uh, used to have a great joke that she would say, you know, she was hanging out with this white girl and she saw this white girl going off on her mother. And she was like, I don't want to do that. And so she went home and her mother told her, she said, I don't want to do that. And she said, she woke up three days later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, you know, we cannot, we cannot be imitating a culture that has walked in entitlement and think we get the same entitlements that they do. We have to bring the goods because they are judging us. I was, oh man, I was having this conversation with someone the other day and it was about, I was even talking about Excel Fest and Creative Cypher and just other things like, you know, I built Creative Cypher 10 years ago and Excel Fest a couple years ago, well, two, a year ago, but we had been working in the festival space for some time. And uh, it was just the self-awareness to know that we have to come to the table with that excellence, as, as you mentioned. And um, what I observed was that oftentimes when an individual or institution or entity got wind of what I was working on or doing, a lot of times they were like, where have you been? I didn't know. When, why are we just now finding out about you? Oh my gosh, this is great. And I'm thinking to myself like, okay, I can understand that, but don't be surprised because so many people of color are already doing things that are so amazing that they're just not on your radar that by the time you find out about them, they're 10 times and 20 times, you know, the skill level of talent because they knew they had to because the opportunities weren't the same. You don't get the opportunity to blow the money and then come back and try it over and over and over again. So by the time you find out about something, they've already polished this thing. This, this diamond is so sharp right now. It's, it's very valuable. And now we have to be able to understand that and then come to the table. As Fat Joe says, yesterday's price is not today's price. <laughs> hey man, you started as a football player in high school. And then when you were in college, you were playing football but you were also starting to do modeling. You were, so yeah. what, what made you go, I think I'm going to go ahead and hit the runway. <laughs> oh man. So um, the church that I went to, one of my mom's mentors was connected to Avenue Fashion Fair uh, in Chicago. And so we would always get invited to the, um, the runway shows, the fashion fair runway shows. And I think I was probably a sophomore or junior in high school. So I was always there. I was at the Ebony building, met you know, and Mrs. Johnson and all that. And I got to see that. And I said, okay, well, I think this could be something. And I just kind of left it. That there wasn't anything to it. Then I went to University of Illinois. I was a 250-pound linebacker. So runway wasn't really something that I was going to do. But I found myself to be a very gregarious person, connecting with a lot of folks. and. Um, uh, sure enough, I got cast in one of these schools' fashion shows my freshman year. And then next thing you know, I was in every show. And this was all school shows. I was still playing ball. And I said, well, this could be something I can explore. And my junior year, sophomore year, junior year, um, 
a beard, a hair care company uh, that was based in Chicago, just happened to be looking for someone to be their print guy. And I uh, had to be very careful because at that time, NCAA didn't have NIL, NIL deals. So it wasn't like I could be a college athlete and marketing a product, but this was right at the time that I was wrapping up playing college ball. So the timing worked well. So I went in, did the photo shoot. They called me back and they said, we want to film again or shoot again in a month or something, let your beard grow. And next thing you know, uh, I, I'll never forget, I was on campus, went into the magazine store, opened up, I think, uh, X, it's interesting, Double XL or King Magazine or something like that. And then I was in Jet. But anyway, I became the face of this beard company. That image got on the radar of a talent agent in Chicago, a print agent in Chicago. And when I came back to Chicago, uh, I dropped almost 70 pounds and signed with uh, Stewart Talent, which was owned by Jane Stewart, who owned Elite. That was the runway division. So that led to me being on the runway. The next thing you know, I'm walking up and down runways two years ago. I was a linebacker, you know, tackling folks, um, opened up Michael Kors in Chicago, and I'm on the runway back and forth. Even with that 70 pound drop, I was still the biggest dude, like on all the shows. And what was fortunate for me was that the runway agency elite, which is what it was called at the time, was in the same building as these other departments. So it opened up a world for more commercial print. Then I went, I was at Second City at the stage, and then my voiceover career started. So all of the agents were literally in this one brownstone in Chicago. And so it, it opened up all of these worlds. But uh, yeah, being a linebacker to runway, a runway model opened up a bunch of other opportunities in entertainment. And when did you start acting? Let's see, what was my first project? Uh, it was actually my first role was a commercial for the military. And they flew me down to Tennessee for this project. And uh, that was my first role. And I think I was pre, yeah, I was pre-union at the time. They flew me down for that and that made me eligible. And then the majority of the projects I booked were actually voice projects. So I did a lot of voiceover work. And um, then I started to branch out and do more theater, um, like local theater in Chicago. And uh, it opened up a world to doing like day player roles and commercials and all of that. Uh, and I'll never forget, I was sitting at the, the SAG office in Chicago, staring at my phone, waiting for a casting director to say yes for this, um, I think it was, it was the director session. So it was me, between me and two other guys. And in that moment, I said, this can't be it. I cannot just sit here and wait because I came from a family of entrepreneurs and clergy. I can build community. I know how to bring in writers, directors, cinematographers. And then that led to me um, just basically saying, I'm gonna start creating my own work. Five minute short film turned to 10. So I went through that process. I memorized the union contract to protect myself as a talent. And then slowly but surely, the independent projects that I would get cast on, every once in a while, would need an advisor or a consultant that could help them with the contracts. And so that turned into a new opportunity for me because I could look at it and say, you know, you better be careful because you're going to get fined for this, or this is something you need to be aware of. Next thing you know, uh, folks started calling me to consult and be a producer on the projects. And then uh, that led to becoming a, in Chicago, a go-to for a lot of rising black and brown storytellers, like new media content creators. And that that led to you know, my, my um, journey with the union, with SAG Opera. That's what I want to talk about. What made you decide that you wanted to run for the board? Um, it felt very organic at the time. Um, this was probably 13, 14 years ago, it feels like. And it felt organic because I was already doing some of the things that 
they wanted somebody on the board to be able to do. Like some of it was, we need fresh ideas. We need new folks in here. Um, some of it was DEI, you know, keeping it real. Like some of it was, we need help attracting uh, more black and brown folks in here. And um, I was just doing that somewhat benevolent, benevolently. I gotta say that word right. You did. I was doing that just just because I had been on sets, and now my friends, like, oh, my friends, the filmmaker. So I'm gonna help them out, or I have access to this studio facility, or I have access to these red cameras. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the middle of doing this already, and they need folks that know how to help the creators that are gonna make these. Uh, micro budget or short film project. They need somebody that can say, hey, it's a bunch of filmmakers that are out there that don't know how to do million projects, but they're going to do a lot of projects that are kind of in that space that you know very well. And for me, it was a very, very organic thing. And I got elected. I was on the board for several terms, left the board, came back, and now I serve as the vice president. All right. That's awesome. Okay, so I want you to um, unpack this for actors, the importance of knowing your contracts as a union actor. The, so I'm gonna just throw all of this out to you and then you just go ahead and sort it out. The importance of knowing your contract, the importance of participating in the union, the importance of, of voting that as a union member to get the vote out when when anything comes up, you know, to vote for whatever, if it's to ratify a contract or turn it down, if it's to vote for board members or um, uh, other members to, to know who they are and vote for them, as well as I want to talk about FICOR, because I think FICOR is the worst thing that has happened to the union. I hate it. I am a union girl through and through. I know the benefits of being in the union. I I hate to see actors getting taken advantage of, um, to have producers call their house and say, hey, we really want to use you, but we can't go union. Uh, would you mind doing this project? Because this role is perfect for you. And, and cheating the actor out of their money cheating them out of their pension and welfare, their their pension and health, and uh, just just undermining um, actors, you know, and actors are so eager to please and you you want me instead of going back to what we were talking about, knowing your well your worth. So um, I've, I know I've thrown a lot at you. You you go ahead and I'm, I'm taking my notes. I'm writing them down. You go ahead and, and share. I wrote them down. So I'll, I'll, I'll go in reverse order and you, you somewhat said a lot of what I would have said about FICOR already. It's just devaluing of the brand, devaluing of your product and it ultimately hurts the ability to negotiate because if you're this entity or individual over here can get it for cheaper, then it's going to be a lot harder for anybody else. Can you say what FICOR is just so that people are clear? Yeah, so FICOR is, and um, in, 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 I'll put it like this, is it's basically um, an actor that, or actor performer that decides to, or could potentially decide to waive their, their perks or privileges as a union performer uh, for the purposes of getting the job. And it basically devalues uh, the negotiating rights. Like well, as a union performer, there are clean contracts. There are agreed upon um, terms that a signatory has to abide by. And if you're if you are as a performer saying that you will work FICOR, you're essentially watering down all of that, saying that these entities are not going to be held accountable for the things that they would have if they were just operating on a union contract. Which includes the union not being able to protect you if you go FICOR. You you know, if they don't pay you your money, the union can't go after them. If they work you beyond your hours and don't pay you overtime, the union can't go after them. If they um, use you and don't pay you, 
the union can't go after no. them. There's no, there's no protect. You're giving up your protection um, because of an immediate opportunity and or gain. And I'll give you a personal example for me. One of the examples of how the union really had my back. This was several years ago. I remember doing a I remember doing like a background spot for an airlines and uh, for one reason or another, when they did the final cut, there was just enough visibility of me in that spot. And so my agent called and said, Hey, you remember that thing you went in and you just did background for, well, that was a union project and you're now being bumped up to, to a principal in that commercial. And so now you're going to receive, you know, residuals and all that stuff. And that because that project though that was a signatory and as a union performer even though i originally went in there and it was like a, a, a background project it now bumped me and now i'm getting residuals on this project and was able to get my health care and all kinds of stuff uh several years ago and so fire is going to do the exact opposite of that so if you're on a project uh to your point um you don't have the protections immediate protections but the abundance of FICOR inevitably leads to the devaluing of the leverage um, that the union can have to negotiate better terms better rates uh, better working conditions and so that's the longer um, repercussion of too many artists going FICOR it just it damages the whole uh, opportunity to to take care of it uh, one of the things you mentioned was the importance of voting, as with anything. We got a big one coming up in in the country. But listen, I'll just say it like this: like if you're not voting, you can't complain. Like don't don't um, don't come back afterwards. In football, we say Monday morning quarterbacks. Like everybody knows what should have happened Monday after the big game on Sunday. But if you have the opportunity to have your voice heard or be a part of it, especially if you're um, a part of an institution or a union where you got the opportunity to, to, to potentially join a committee or at least be present in the room when there are sessions so you can learn about things, like take advantage of that stuff. And so you need to be an active member in that. And so it's extremely important uh, to move things forward, but you need to be an active participant in the process versus uh, just being at the mercy of the process itself. Uh, something else you mentioned here uh, we, we talked about the union. We kind of touched on this when we talked about FICOR. Uh, outside of the, um, the protections uh, and the uh, financial gain from projects that have residuals, things, I'm, you know, I'm, those that have, have worked on certain projects are, are getting checks for years and years down the road uh, for, for things that they worked on. But there's also a community that's there as well. There's a, there's, a, there's a community of performers that understand that process and you're able to build camaraderie as well. Um, when it comes to the contracts, uh, you know, I know in Chicago and I, I know in other places, there are always sessions where you can come in and learn about the contracts, sit in, hear about working in wages, understand what's gonna happen while we're in a brainstorming phase before something is even submitted or ratified, like there's, a, you have the, the access to be a part of the entire process. And when it comes to contracts, I mentioned earlier, that's how I became a part of, became a producer was because as an actor, I remember being on a project one day and I'm like, this is whack. You know, this is like, I can't do this again. Next time I'm on a project, they need to make sure that this, this, this is in place. You know, and the only way to do that is if they're held accountable. And that is uh, and that is what the union will do. So I knew, I, you know, you don't have to memorize the contracts, but I knew that if I was on the if I was on a project, I needed to know my stuff. And I would have never been able to tell you that by doing that, it would have turned into me being a producer and launching creative soccer. But I just knew I needed, as we said earlier, I needed to do my research because I needed to protect myself. I also knew that. Um, coming from being an athlete and then eventually I kind of jumped over, but I became a coach for a period of time. But, be, but being an athlete, you understand or you grow to understand the business of sports and how you can be 
easily just a commodity. I, I tore three of my ACLs, three of them. I tore, I had three knee surgeries, tore both ACLs, wow. and all kinds of stuff happened, surgeries and all that. And, you know, next man up is what they'll say. You know, you're down, next person. So I knew by the, by the time I got into the entertainment industry as a talent, that that could not be the only space that I was in. Even if I focused on being a performer, I would have to know the business of show as well. And um, you've got to know those contracts so that you can protect yourself. A debate that goes on with non-union actors not wanting to join the union because they feel it limits them. You know, they can make money. You have the right to work states. You can go and, and you know, get on a project and um, be on camera. And so for them, that's a great, that's great. I'm on camera. But doing that keeps the, go back to keeping the union weak, not just FICOR, but just actors who do non-union work and don't think about the, the consequences because they, they want to eat now, but they're not thinking about the cost for later because they're missing out on residuals. They, they get that little check that pays their rent that month, but that, that job could have paid for their rent that month, could have paid for their rent next year, could have paid for their uh, pension and, and health, give them a um, uh, insurance plan, but they are so eager to work now that they forfeit the stuff. And my, my, um, my heart hurts because when I came into the business, so many actors made such a great living on, on acting. If they only got six jobs for the year, they were great. They were taken care of. This was even background actors. I knew background actors who, who had houses. They had, you know, they, they were union uh, background actors, but they were able to buy houses from that. Now you can work as an actor on a, on a um, streaming show for two, three seasons. And you still need another job because they're the way they're doing it now is they will, if you're in this season, they're going to shoot you out in two, three days. So you don't get the privilege of, of coming in for this episode. And then you come in three episodes. No, if you're in five episodes, they're going to shoot you out in those couple of days. So you, you now don't even get the benefit of getting that full paycheck. I think that is disgusting. I just, I, you know, as an actor producer, I think that is disgusting. I think you, you know, the ecosystem, it, it, it's like the ones who feed off of the system are making way more money than the ones who are upholding the, the system. You know, if there's no talent, if there's no writer, no mm -hmm. actor, no director, there's no film or TV show. If you don't have those three entities, executive producer of Netflix or Hulu or whatever, we'll have no job. So to, to um, shrink the pay of the talent to me is, is diabolical. <laughs> it is. It it's is greed. a it's, horrible, it's horrible thing, which leads me to doing your own projects. How can we as actors start doing our own projects so we are not at the mercy, utilizing the union, you know, utilizing the union to, to make those micro budget films or those little low, 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 ultra low budget films to be able to do our art but not suffer because we want to be working. Yeah, and I think that it brings up a, a great point. We actually have a panel at the festival uh, sponsored by BMO. It's called uh, Standing on Business. It says studio versus indie. And it's the whole conversation around 
do you go with a system that could potentially uh, take advantage of you or do you create your own? So that'll be a, a pretty robust conversation. But I think one of the questions that is important to ask uh, the actor performer is if they view themselves as a business, because that changes your whole perspective anyway. And so now am I creating this content because it is a passion project, which is beautiful and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if you're looking at this being a life, uh, you know, uh, something that generates revenue, then you have to consider all of these other aspects of it. Uh, is this a commercially viable project? Is this something that uh, will generate revenue? And, and there's some great examples with those that are labeled influencer. I used to um, co-chair New Media for SAG Africa, And so this was at the beginning of YouTube and the internet in general, but specifically YouTube democratizing how content was created, distributed, and monetized. The commercial that you know, we're so used to it now, but the, the moment when commercials were at the gas stations or in the cabs or in all, that was all new media. It was new stuff. Now it's all content. But when that came out, we had to really consider like, how does this union performer receive their residuals if that content is not aired on you know, network television the same way? All these things have to be taken into account. And ultimately, if you're an actor performer, if you're out there thinking about creating your own content to monetize it, to monetize it, to monetize it, I would say you, it would be good to research the advertisers because ultimately that's where a lot of the money's coming from. And everything else is a vehicle. It's a, it's a as they say, a cog on the wheel of commerce. You know, and is there is there something there? We had a a, a gentleman at our um, that spoke uh, at our festival. His name's Corporate. He was a he's a, he still is a musician. He started creating comical um, pieces on Instagram, and now I see it a lot on TikTok. And um, it was to promote his music, but he started to get so much traction with his uh, social media clips that he built an audience. And because he built he built that audience, the advertisers came straight to him. Now, where this resonates with me outside of entertainment is growing up in a family full of clergy, starting in the pulpit when I was 13. Some of the most powerful people, if not the most, were folks that could deal with large crowds with sensitive matters and get a crowd to buy in and listen to things. So fast forward in my life to being an actor and a producer, that resonates with me because these individuals or have the ability to draw audiences and that brings them leverage. And so if the intent is to monetize this, then those are the numbers that you need to be able to have that leverage. And now, instead of you working on said studio network show where you're getting paid your paycheck and everything else is being spliced and you're the last person to get paid, you know, maybe you position yourself with the brand uh, without over commercializing yourself. Um, to uh, to generate some significant revenue. And so I've heard from multiple people that have no desire whatsoever to do anything on television, to ever do a feature film, or to ever do anything remotely close to the old studio model because of the business model that they have right now. And so I would say that is something to consider. Again, question one is, are you viewing yourself as a business? And if so, this is a path, not the only, but this is a path to take um, uh, to to generate what could be significant uh, significant revenue. I mean, I remember, I even remember the first time I ever went to an audition and I was asked about my social media father. I was like, whoa, okay, this thing has value, you know? And that is, um, it's something to think about if you are creating your own, content what do you ultimately want to do with it well we're in a different time right we're it's a whole new country out there we're 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 in a new country now and it is imperative for us to know that we are the ceo of our business we're not actors as actors were perceived 10 15 years ago we are ceos who act that is what we are and the union is to help our small business stay 
alive. That is what the union does for us, the CEO of our acting. We we are not we're not just actors. We are the CEO of our acting, and we need to know. Okay, I'm, I I got this small business, so I need to uh, pay this group here because they got my back. It's like in the old days, the gangsters knew who the you know you you knew who the cops were that you could pay off to have your back, so you could do your dirty deed. Well. As actors, we need to know who's got our back, not to do a dirty deed, but to keep us safe. And it's important to know our business as actors. We need to know the business. It's not about the craft. In the old days, a lot of actors never learned the business. We hear now how it hurt them, you know, because back in the day, there was no social media. So you couldn't, you didn't know that you know, so-and-so didn't know his stuff and the agent took him for his money and blah, 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 blah. But today we have all this information and for us to uh, go out as actors, not understand that you need to have another side job. You, you need to have other money coming in. So when you're offered bad deals, you can turn them down with ease and not feel choked like, uh, uh, but if I don't take this job, I'm not gonna eat. You know, you have to be able to go, thank you, but I will pass. To be able to say no with dignity and walk away with no uh, hesitation, you know, to go, yeah, that doesn't work for me, but thank you. And I learned that through stand up. I, I started doing stand up years ago as a way to get to the front of the line as an actor, because I couldn't sing or dance. And all the actors of color sang and dance, you know, but I, I, I didn't do that. So I was like, okay, what else can I do? I can do comedy. So I started doing stand up, and stand up taught me to be the CEO of my business, because as a stand up, you are truly self employed. You know, when you go in, it's between you and the booker. You get your money and you know, and you gotta wait till the end of the night to get your money. And sometimes they don't wanna pay you. And so you have to get ugly with people, you know, um, and it teaches you to be, you know, you're the boss, you know, if you don't get your money, you aren't gonna eat tomorrow. So I would stay and say, do I need to go with you to the ATM? Cause I can, how, how are we doing this? How, how am I getting my money? Because I'm not leaving here without my money. And as an actor, you have to show up in the same way. But the lovely thing is when you're in the union, you can call the union and say, hey, uh, so-and-so didn't give me my money. So I need you to make that call for me. Because a lot of times you have agencies that won't take care of your finances. They'll go, well... You know, we don't want to cause a scene. We don't want to. Um, I, I remember an agent saying to me, you know, you don't want to get a, 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 a name as a troublemaker in this business. Oh. And that was before I knew what my union did. You know, it was after that when I told somebody, hey, you know, these people were having me sign uh, blank contracts. After, you know, like, and, and I didn't have the mindset the first week to look and go, oh, you didn't put my times down. I had learned from um, background actors to always keep a little book that every time I went on a job, write down when I got there, the time I started and the time I finished. And if there was, uh, if we broke for a meal, what time that was, if we stayed late, what time we got off. So I had recorded it even though they hadn't put it. So the first week I was anticipating I was going to get money, you know, that it was going to be a healthy paycheck. And I saw my first paycheck. I said, there's something wrong here. This is, this doesn't add up with my figures, my numbers. Yeah. And when I told the agent and he called up and, and they said, well, no, you know, there is no, that was it. It was, it was just, I said, no, they're stealing money from me. And he said, well, you know, don't be a troublemaker because then everybody will know in this business that you're a troublemaker. So I went, I worked on this project six weeks. 
after that, every time I went and they had me sign off, I was like, excuse me, I need you to put down my times. I can't sign anything. And I remember one time they, they uh, let us out like, right before meal penalty was going to start and they hadn't fed us. And so I heard the AD, the second AD say, oh, we're going to get the food for the crew. So ask them what they want to eat. So when the person came, I said, but I'm not going to sign it until I get to eat. So you, so mm-hmm. I, you need to tell me what's on the menu that I could choose from. And then once I eat, then I'll sign off. And, and that's how I handled it. But after that project, I learned the importance of the union and the importance of going to the union. So, so I, I just want to say this because there are a lot of actors that don't know that they have backup. They may be in the union, but they don't really know what the union does because they don't participate. They don't read uh, the website. They don't go in there. They don't go to panels. They don't, they don't do their due diligence. Uh, in the union. I want to ask you about art with a mission-driven purpose. What is the difference of being an artist with a mission-driven purpose as opposed to an artist who just has a purpose? I kind of always knew that that this was a vehicle for something greater. And even when I think about some of the opportunities I've gotten, it hasn't been you know, sometimes because I was the most talented person or um, the smartest person in the room, but I have noticed that there was a, a level of favor as it relates to an ability to uh, communicate with audiences or minister. You know, it's, for me, it's like that became the thing. And, and I didn't realize that at first. I mean, I, don't, I took that all for granted. I didn't think about any of that until I was in well in the industry. I didn't think about it when I was growing up. To me, it was just what we did. You know, you, hey, you're going to usher. You're going to be an usher. You're going to read scripture. You're going to be in front of the audience. I didn't think about it at all. It was just what we did. And it wasn't until I got into the industry and then just saw how horrible communication can be from time to time that those transferable skills were things I was acquiring mm. and um, eventually would be able to use those and that this vehicle called entertainment or media, the bigger, the, the, the bigger part of it was um was ultimately all storytelling and um even if we think about scripture if you think about it's all storytelling think about politics you think about marketing pitching things it's still storytelling and so i i realized that having honed some of those skills that it wasn't just to entertain me and that it had to be about something bigger than that because entertaining can come and go, but uh, the ability to mobilize people was a whole different conversation. I was blessed with the opportunity to use this vehicle for that. If an artist is listening right now, an actor, a filmmaker, a writer, a director, and they are on purpose, they're intentional in wanting to be that artist. What can you tell them to expand them to be an artist who is mission driven so that the purpose is bigger than them, which is what you were talking about. It's bigger. It's not just, well, I want to be acting. I, you know, I want to, I want to do a movie. I want to do this, but I'm doing this because um, for me, um, art is good medicine. It's healing. You know, when I hear actors say, oh, you know, acting is not a big deal. It's not uh, brain surgery. Yes, it is. It is brain surgery. To me, it is It is a healing surgery that there are, are films that can transform somebody's life. They can see a movie. They can be thinking of of doing something terrible to themselves and then watching the film, they get an aha moment. They uh-huh. are able to uh, leave at the end of that movie and feel better about themselves or a, a play or a TV show or music that you may hear something 
and you may be in a very dark place. And just by hearing that piece of music or that comedy show or whatever, all of a sudden it it brightens you. It bring it's it's like a sermon, you know. It's like a mm-hmm. sermon uh, in disguise of oh wow oh god had that for me oh my god you know he brought me into that place just at that time and and changed my life you know there's a a reason why parables parables are so powerful parables and songs and some of the greatest speakers and teachers that is um i think it was twain that said well brevity is the soul of all wit but this idea that you can deliver a message within this vehicle so it can be retained and change someone's life or inspire them or motivate them to change their own lives. Um, you know, I, it resonates with me because if you, if you think from a scriptural standpoint, uh, these are all uh, perspectives and stories put together in some way, shape or form, depending on how deep you want to go with that. But um, it ultimately is, is done in a way so that you can uh, apply it. You know, so there's an application to it all. Um, so I would tell I would tell an artist that is seeking the, the answer for that uh, is to do things outside of entertainment. <laughs> you know, uh, because I think that you could potentially find the answer maybe while you're working, maybe in some something that has to do with entertainment. But um, for me, it was outside of that. It wasn't working as an actor that gave me the aha moment that using acting would be a vehicle for me it was something outside of that you know and i realized that oh i see something now you know i see that i i I'll remember this 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 is um one thing i'll say with that i remember i was asked to speak at church or somewhere and um and i had i didn't realize that i was using theatricality or just certain stage certain things you learn from being a performer on stage it was just kind of happening and it wasn't until i came back and took my seat and i got the response from people and i'm thinking i'm just giving them information but it wasn't until I came back and people were saying like, wait a minute, you've got, there's something here. There's, you know, this is what you were born to do. Like I started getting that. I'm like, no, I don't. I'm just, they just told me to, to tell people what I thought about this or to give them my, you know, my perspective on something. Um, but it, it was like outside of that, that I realized, oh, those years of training as a performer, as an actor were, giving me these tools that I could take out and use at certain times when I'm in front of this audience speaking about this and that, you know? And so to me, that's what opened up that world. So with that being said, for many of those that may be listening, you may find that answer outside of acting. You might find that answer volunteering for an organization. You might find that answer working with your family or mentoring somebody. You might find that answer um, in church or, you know, reading, you might find that answer. You might find that answer just sitting down and being still, you know, you may find that answer there, but a lot of times I know it's, it may not come while you're in the act of doing that thing. You just realize that, wait a minute, this isn't the thing at all. This is just the tool to do the thing. What do you love about entertainment? That's a great question. I think I, I I would have to say that what I love about it is probably the same thing that I may think about it. And that is that entertain has the ability to grab someone's mind. And as with many things, if it's used for the right reasons, you could do something great with that. But it also has the ability to dumb us down and turn us into robots (laughs) and um uh and do a lot of damage um 
if we're not so responsible. I'm, I'm, if, if we if have not to, responsible, we correct. have to be responsible with the gift. We have yes. to um, use the gift for the great one, not for ourselves. That's the, I think that's the, the thing is like, God created me to use this as a gift so I could give him glory, not give myself glory, but to give him the glory. Okay, so I get to do my art to transform lives for the kingdom. I get to tell stories to transform lives for the kingdom. I get to create stories and put them up on, on, on the screen, be it the big screen, the medium screen, or the computer screen, or the phone screen to transform lives. But he's, you know, in the Bible, the, and, and we don't hear this much in church, but God used the artists to do great things in the Bible. They, they had big jobs, but we tend to dumb that down when we're talking about art. It's like, oh, art isn't important. Well, God is the creator and he is the master artist. And if he's given us uh, the ability to create, is because he's expecting us to do something good with it. He has given that to us to do some, you know, he is the great creator and we are made in his image to also create. And we want, we want to create stuff that represents our God. We want to create stuff that brings joy. It brings healing. It brings deliverance. It brings a repentance sometimes. You know, that you may see something and it, it, it may uh, affect you in such a way. It could be, you know, just an artist who made a, a piece of a sculpture or a, a painting and you see it and it resonates with you, that the beauty of it or it, or it convicts you, you know, that because if you look at God's art, his artwork, does all of that for us. You know, when you see a beautiful sunrise or sunset, or you look at a, a garden and you go, God did this. You, when you see people of different colors and sizes and shapes, you go, God did this. You know, man thinks he could do stuff, but he can't create like God can create. And if we are allowing the Holy Spirit, if we're being the vessel, for the Holy Spirit to use us creatively, just think what we can do. I mean, we know what, what can be done when the devil uses our creativity, but what can we do when we let God use us to, to be the vessel to create? That's the, I think that is the thing. As artists, we want to be purposeful um, in that walk. It's like, use me, Lord, use me in my art to affect change for your glory. Because it's not about me, but it's about you in me. There's nothing I can do. This gift you've given me is not, I didn't earn it. So I don't, I don't get the right to think I'm entitled to it. It's just, you, you chose me. So do with me what you will. And I think as artists, we have to walk that way because then it frees us from anxiety. It frees us from stress. It, it frees us from being imprisoned and thinking small. God created us to think big. You know, he tells us uh, not to think lowly or highly, but to think well. You know, we have to, you know, he wants us to think well of ourselves. You know, so we have to find that that middle ground, not to go one one side or the other. You know, I'm no good. I am the king. I am the great mm -hmm. one. No, I am a child of the living God and I walk with him. Thank you so much for joining us and checking out this video. Please let us know what you think in the comments below and share with a friend who also needs information on film festivals. And don't go anywhere because this next video coming up is all about PR. And as actors, we need PR. 
and Tammy Lynn breaks it down for you. Let's go.